Hi, I'm Sarah Ackerman, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Sherry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey. Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Sarah Ackerman. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to HankGarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for their faithful support and for enabling us to bring you quality content like we do. Uh, Crystal Watanabe from Pico's House is uh, one of the best editors I've ever met and uh, whose work I really admire. She offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's currently booking for May, so go ahead and send her uh, a message now to uh, get your project scheduled with her. She has four proofreaders on staff, so she can... uh, accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time than some other editors do. Uh, She's a new affiliate member of the SFWA, and she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Uh, Most of her experience is with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle-grade fantasy, uh, but she really enjoys editing all genres and can really make your project shine. If you will mention author stories when booking uh, your editing services, you can receive a $75 discount on manuscripts over 60,000 in length or $25 discount on short stories. Pico's House, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Please tell Crystal that you heard about it on author stories. Also, the Debt Collector series by Chuck Buddha. Debt is a death sentence. Michael Wright lives the American dream. He works hard every day, but still lives paycheck to paycheck. The bills keep piling up, and now his 10-year-old daughter requires surgery to save her life. Michael is in a race against time to find money, but how far is he willing to go? Is he prepared to do whatever it takes? Can he defeat a menacing evil that stands in his way? The Debt Collector series is a gripping tale of psychological horror, raising questions about our modern lifestyles and the terrifying possibilities that hit too close to home. One reader described it as if serial killers and Wall Street made friends. Pay up and die, delinquent, bankrupt. The Debt Collector series is available in paperback and ebook formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy. Willow Adair has a picture-perfect life, or so it seems. A stunning model turned wife and mother, she lives in a beautiful home with her husband and two kids in historic Bexley, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. On the outside, she has everything. On the inside, she struggles with issues of self-worth, spurned by her neglectful husband and hated by her rebellious teen daughter. Willow never feels she is good enough. She fears everyone she loves will leave. Walk Beside Me is the story of a woman who peels away the layers to find her inner warrior, a woman who faces insurmountable odds and, thanks to her earthly angels, learns to treasure the gift of God's infinite light and love. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to HankGarner.com. There's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Sarah Ackerman on the show with me. Sarah has a brand new book out called Island of Sweet Pies and Soldiers, and it's a phenomenal book. I think you're really going to love it. Uh, Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. Well, I am so glad uh, that you are here. Uh, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, let's see. Um, I always loved writing, but for me, when I was younger, I tended towards like poetry. So even in, I remember in sixth 
grade particularly, we had to do a poem book project. And I would always write poems. And I also always like to write about nature um, in my poems. And so I think I would have to say around sixth grade. And then it continued on from there. Um, and also in high school, my creative writing class, that was my favorite class. And uh, But I never really dreamed I'd be writing novels. That kind of happened later when I was in my 40s. Nice. Um, so how- pretty big pretty big gap there it, well, yeah um did your love of poetry uh hang with you it did although once i started writing novels i really haven't had the time to write poetry right um but i think just kind of that observation and attention to detail um i think really helped with the novel writing nice uh, what sorts of things did you like to read when you were younger? Well, I loved reading, I mean, from anywhere from like the Bernstein Bears to then I loved the Nancy Drew books when I was a little bit older. I think I read all of those like several times each. And then, um, you know, I just, I loved mysteries. I think mysteries were my favorite. And then I went through a period of kind of uh, the Zane Grey Westerns. My cousins had those and I loved those. And then I went through a period of loving science fiction. So it's kind of been a whole gamut of of books. I love all kinds of books. Uh, Where did you grow up, Sarah? I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. Oh, wow. That, uh, yeah. I think for a lot of us who, you know, live uh, in the uh, the continental U.S., uh, Hawaii is a, is a magical place. It definitely is, even for us that live in Hawaii, I think. Um, I grew up on Oahu, the main island, and then my grandparents lived on an outer island, the big island. And so I came over here a lot. This is where I am now. I moved here a couple of years ago. And this is actually where my book is set And I think it's my favorite island because it has all the way from lava at the volcano to snow on the top of the mountains to the most beautiful. I think we have the most beautiful ocean here as well. You just get the the full gamut, don't you? Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Um, You said you didn't come back to writing uh, until later in life. Uh, What did you pursue as a career? Well, I was a, I went to graduate school for psychology, so I was a school counselor and, um, and also a teacher. I ended up working in the schools. And then I kind of went through just I was ready for a change. And I had also had some experience with acupuncture, receiving it and having my dog receive it and have some mir- miraculous results. So I decided I was going to attend acupuncture school. And so... And at that point, um, I was able to not be teaching full time. And I had a little bit more time on my hands. And so then I just decided, you know what, I have some morning, you know, I had more mornings free. And I I had been, you know, I love reading. So I had always just thought, well, if this person can write a book, I should be able to write a book. And so I think when the time was right and I had more time, I just sat down and started writing. I I had no idea what I was doing, but I figured I would try it. Uh, your your bio on your website says that you blame Hawaii for your addiction to writing. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I think that I just, I love, I'm kind of an outdoors person. So I love hiking, being out in nature. And some of my first novels were sort of nature stories. I mean, they all had some a love story and suspense or intrigue. But they were also in nature, kind of adventure stories, saving the or native birds or the turtles or um, kind of outdoorsy stories and so and every time I go out hiking or go on a trip or an adventure in Hawaii I I usually come upon something that I'm like hmm like that would make a great book a great novel 
and I start, the ideas are just stacking up. So I think that that's what I mean by that. So what was that first uh, novel idea that you had when you uh, decided to write that first novel? Well, that one took place on the island of Kauai. And uh, every year I go there with my, my girlfriend and we take, we oftentimes we're at the beach, sort of like a girl's trip, but we also go up to, there's this, to the mountains and um, it's like a native forest. It's kind of mysterious and it's a bog and there's a lot of native birds up there. They only live at the top of the mountains here and many and actually most of them have gone extinct, sadly. And so that story, I kind of wanted to portray those birds and their story and also have it be like an adventure um, adventure story. So that's what it ended up being. Gotcha. You, you, you knew nothing about uh, novel writing at that point. Uh, kind of where did you no, de- where did you decide to start? Well, and I, I still think I probably need to rewrite the beginning of it, um, but um, I just started writing. I had read Stephen King's book on writing right. a while back, and I had just, I was like, I'm just going to write. And I, I sat down every day for about an hour, and then I was just kind of seeing how the story flowed. And, and then, you know, I had heard other authors say that the stories will write themselves. And I, you know, I got a taste of that. And I think um, that really pulled me in. And then I had a friend of mine read it. Like she'd come um, and visit me every few weekends. And she, she was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. And I could see that she wanted to read more. And so that, you know, that kind of gave me a little bit of the push like, wow, somebody's actually interested in this. And so I kept writing. And and I told people at the end of that book, I said, well, this might be the worst book ever written, but at least I wrote it. <clears throat> and uh, so then I went to a writer's conference. And from there, I kind of helped, you know, developed it. Gotcha. Um, what did you do with the book after, after you had it written? Did, did you, uh, shop for publishers? What, what, what direction well, did you take? Yeah, I did actually. I, I had, I hired an editor, a professional editor, a freelance editor to work with me. And then we got it, you know, whipped into better shape. And then I did send it out to agents and I had a few requests, but I didn't get an agent with that book. Uh, and actually two more subsequent books. And uh, and I still kept going to writers' conferences, and I still kept writing because I loved it. And then um, with several of the other books, too, I did hire ed- an editor, or I had a, also one of them, I had an editor friend edit it for me. But, um, yeah, I just, it wasn't until the fourth one that I, that I got the agent. Gotcha. I learned the sweet pies and soldiers. Yeah. So, so tell us about the story uh, of uh, Island Sweet Pie and uh, Sweet Pies and Soldiers. It's it's out now. It's it's been out for uh, a couple of weeks now. When this uh, releases, uh, what what is the the setup for the story? Well, the story originally I was interested in because my grandmother had always talked about the war uh, when I was a child growing up, and that. I was just always intrigued by her stories. And one of the particular ones was about a lion because my grandma here had smuggled over a lion cub with them when they came. And they were here training for Iwo Jima, although they didn't know it at the time. And so I just, I, I guess I was very interested in the lion, first of all. And then as I dug deeper, um, you know, I learned more and more about the soldiers and their story and what they were going through while they were here and how, you know, for a lot of them, this was their last stop. They, you know, they didn't come back from Iwo Jima. And, uh, but the other thing that I thought was interesting was 
they never forgot, obviously, war. It was just at the forefront of their lives. And they had had, like, though the war was so scary and it was such a dark time, it was also very, I think, a very powerful time for them in terms of developing friendships and seeing how the people banded together to help each other. That really stuck with me. The emotion that she held, you know, for all those years. And so we, when I kind of sat down to write my book, I just wanted to get that feeling. So the, that's the, kind the, of the jumping off point. The main character, Violet Iverson, uh, where, where did she come from? When, when did she kind of come into your life? Well, I knew all along that I wanted it to be very loosely based on my grandmother. So even though the story is not, you know, that didn't happen, um, she is her personality and kind of how she looks. Um, her strength, I think, was very much my grandmother, Helen. So that's where that's where she came from. What does the uh, the name of the book represent? Well, interesting that you asked that because with the my book was originally titled Sugarcane Train, which is how the soldiers arrived in Honoka um, and then back to the ship. But we changed it to Island of Sweet Pies and Soldiers because I think it's definitely more telling of what the subject matter is because they're on an island and the women, makes, they make the pies for the soldiers. And um, yeah, so I think it just kind of sums everything up. The uh, you know uh, the uh, in in World War II, all of us know uh, what happened at Pearl Harbor and the the attack on uh, on the base there. But uh, I, I think after that, people really uh, forget about Hawaii's role in in the war and the war effort and and the uh, you know what that then meant for uh, you know for for uh, the islands and and going forward. Uh, I, I really appreciate that you really bring this to light. Um, I, I know we're just past the, the anniversary of Iwo Jima. Um, mm -hmm. were, were there things in the researching and the writing of this book that you discovered uh, that maybe you didn't know before? Actually, there are a lot of, a lot of stuff I didn't know before. I'm not like an ex, you know, I'm not a history buff per se, but just probably and it was surprising to me, like I didn't even know about Camp Tarawa other than that it had kind of been there and there's a monument. I didn't know. Surprisingly, a lot of people here don't know. Um, you know, 50,000 Marines were here training for Iwo Jima in Hawaii, you know, for that year before they went. There were two divisions um, and mine that I wrote about, they're the fifth division. But that was to me just such an important piece of history. Like these were this little corner of Hawaii training, you know, and people here still don't know about it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, if we don't know about it, then people around the world surely don't, you know. Right. Right. So when when you're tackling a subject like this, how do you go about uh doing the research and, and making sure that you get uh, you know, the, the facts, right. Uh, but not only just the facts, but really bringing out the personal stories of what happened. Well, I mean, I think I had the advantage of, first of all, having all my grandma's stories in my memory. And then my uncle and my mom were here on this island. And so I, I can, you know, I asked them, um, and some family friends as well. Uh, my dad's family, they like a lot of the people, they went to the mainland because the government, um, you know, was recommending people leave during the war. And so my dad's family did leave. But just to kind of get, you know, like, oh, I asked my mom, did they, did they have this back then or did they have that back then? Or, you know, lo little stories like the swinging kitchen door, letting the light signals out um, was something that happened. Or the cars that they would tie up ready to um, drop down to kind of block the roads in case the Japanese came. And just the fear, you know, how their lives were just completely interrupted for all those years. 
um, it was helpful to have firsthand stories. And then I also did a lot of research for um, I found that my mom and my grandfather, because it was a pickle, they had the old school yearbooks, and I found that to be really helpful because they had stories on the war effort, the victory gardens, and pictures and names, and you know, I'm trying to get a feel for, for what people were like by looking at the yearbook. Nice, nice. Um, are, are you a, uh, a planner by nature, or uh, do you do pants as you write? Um, I think I'm probably a little bit more of a pantser, but I do... I do have an idea, you know, I have, I try to have a somewhat of a very loose framework, but a lot of times, especially characters will kind of pop up um, along the way that I had no idea about that become, if not prominent, then they become, you know, at least characters that I really end up liking, like Bernard Lalamour. I found, I just appeared. And then I found that I really liked his story and his character. Nice. Um, how long did you work on this book? Well, the first draft, I think, took me about probably five or six months. And then I did, you know, I usually do several rewrites. And then I had to kind of put it aside because I was finishing acupuncture school. And I had sent out some query letters and had a lot more interest on this book than my other ones. And um, so I kind of felt like I just felt like this was the one that will get me to And then when I revisited it, um, I hired a wonderful editor, Elizabeth Bernstein, and she just helped me get it to the next level. And then after we did that round of edits, I had an offer from Elaine Spencer or did content herself. Um, it, they made me an offer. So I was beyond excited about that. So I think overall, the it was a couple of years, probably two years, with a break in between to school. Do you have a, a specific place that you like to write? Well, I did. Um, I lived in a cottage on Oahu, and so I'd write out on my porch. And that was I'm kind of, I like to be near a window or on a deck so that I can look outside and not feel like I'm cooped up. But I've moved since then, and now we live um, where we live on Waimea, and Waimea is a lot colder. So I usually write it at the table or on the porch, like my dining room table, or if it's nice weather, I'll write on the porch again. Are there any things that you use uh, to inspire yourself? Uh, maybe when you're, when you're sitting down to write uh, at a new session, uh, do, do you use music? Uh, do, you, do you read things beforehand? Is there anything that you use to kind of psych yourself up and to get into the story? Not really. Nope. <laughs> Not, I don't have a time to learn music or anything. I just really find that I need to be, I like to do it pretty soon after I get up so that I just feel like my brain's a little more empty at that point. Right. And get that out of the way. Uh, I also make sure that I leave off the day before in between, like in the middle of a scene or I'll start a new scene so that when I sit down to write, I have somewhere just to kind of go right away from, not have to think, okay, now where am I going to start today? I, so I like, that to me is like my biggest. Yeah, I like that idea of, of leaving something kind of un, unfinished uh, because not only does mm -hmm. it give you a place to start the next day, uh, but you know, for me, if I do that, I, I find that, I that I'm kind of walking around through the day thinking about that, that half finished thing that I did. Uh, and then when I sit down, yeah. uh, there's all these ideas that have come to me, you know, the previous day and uh, it usually, you know, starts with pretty fertile soil. Exactly. All that walking around or driving or, you know, if I take a walk with a dog, that's where I do a lot of the work for sure. Exactly. Um, do you, as you, like, I, I know you said that you, you love nature and the outdoors. Um, when you're out and about and something uh, strikes you a certain way or, uh, you know, gives you a moment of inspiration, uh, do you record those things? Do you, do you make notes for yourself that, oh, I, I need to remember this? Uh, uh, or do, do you just kind of uh, hold those things in your mind until you can get back to write about it? 
Well, it de- I guess it depends. I sometimes I will send myself a text message if I don't have any pen or paper nearby. Um, and that otherwise I oftentimes will just, just remember it. But I do have, I have like several notes in my computer, like a, a page of book ideas and stuff. And sometimes I'll go back and look at it and be like, oh my gosh, I don't even remember writing that down. So it really goes to show you, if you don't write it down, it's gone. It can be just gone. The new book is called uh, I Love Sweet Pies and Soldiers. It's out now. I highly recommend everyone go pick up a copy of it. Uh, Sarah, if people are interested in your work, uh, where can they find you online to find out more about you? Um, I'm at ackermanbooks.com. And I'm also on Twitter at ackermanbooks. And Instagram, Sarah Ackerman Books. So those would be the the best places. Awesome. Uh, We're going to link to it in the show notes and send everybody to see you. Uh, Thanks for taking time to come on the show, Sarah. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. I found Absalom in the parlor by the fireplace. Irving had encouraged his guests to reenact the famous Van Tassel party of the legend and tell ghost stories. The brandy poured freely, the men smoked, and the chestnut tails of the region were trotted out one by one in parade. The White Lady of Raven Rock, the ghost of poor Major André, hanged from the tulip tree aside the post road and, of course, the headless horseman. Did you ride that night, Brom? asked young Joseph Martling. Was it you that affrighted the schoolteacher? Brom sat and all eyes were on him. Whatever the truth, I hope his son will forgive my part in it. There's nothing to forgive, said the son of Ichabod. It's a grand work, Mr. Irving, a grand fiction. On the mantel, a bronze clock chimed eleven. "'Tis almost the witching hour," said Irving. "'Time for all children to be abed, lest they be caught on the road.' "'I would not be caught dead on the road tonight,' said Martling, who lived nearby. "'Why not?' said I. "'Let us ride Ichabod's route back to Beekmantown.' in commemoration. The young men cheered the idea. I turned to Absalom. Would you join us? No. It's absurd. The sleepy hollow boys jeered at him. Absalom sighed. Very well, then. We will ride together as a group. The gloom that found us on the road was terrible. In those days, no gas lights lit the post road, and the way from Roost to the bridge crossing still wound past Wildy Swamp, fearfully black at that hour. I watched Absalom riding to my left. He was a thin, spectral thing in the moonlight. Idle talk died on our lips, and our small band rode with only the sound of horse hooves for accompaniment. There it is, whispered Martling, the hanging tree. The old tulip tree twisted against the starry sky. The road broke to either side of it. That is where your father is said to have first seen the thing. My companion had slowed, gazing fearfully at the branches above. I saw something, he whispered. I saw a body swinging from the tree. Come now, Absalom. You don't believe in ghosts, do you? Hurry up, then. Quick, before the horseman rides. You can't reason with a headless man. As if on cue, a wind rose. Branches tore and leaves swept the air. A terrible cracking laugh rose all around. Eyes opened and watched us from the deep. The faces of spirits appeared. Horrors rose from the Andre Brook. Our horses whinnied and reared. Absalom grabbed my arm and pointed. The horseman stood on the slope above. He raised his hatchet. His army of ghosts fell upon us. My horse and I turned circles, terrorized and confused. 
young Martling shouted. We have to make the bridge, and rode off. Make the bridge, cried the others as one, and our companions scattered, tearing up the post road with a clatter of frantic hooves. Make the bridge! The horseman gathered his form and lunged at Absalom. Young Crane dodged the blade, dug heels into the flanks of his steed, and fled. Cries of, Make the bridge! echoed all around. Where? cried Absalom, galloping into the swamp, his voice distant and small. Where is the bridge? Someone tell me! Help! He was gone before I could answer. Yet what could I have said? The bridge of legend is gone, torn down. It shall never be crossed again. I watched Absalom splash into wildy swamp, the horseman in pursuit. And I knew what his fate would be.